That's carried. Thank you. Now we move to um, public forum and deputations. Um, and our first deputation this morning um, is from John Gould, who's joining us online this morning. John, good morning. Um, your deputation is on two items, item 19, the organics processing plans, and item 12, the South Library. Thank you for joining us um, by Zoom. You have 10 minutes for the deputation, um, and that would include any time for questions if you wanted to allow some time for questions. So um, over to you. Thanks for joining us. Kia Koto. Can you all, all hear me and see me okay? Loud and clear. And can you see the first slide, implications of organics processing plant closure? Uh, not as yet, but apparently it's um, about to pop up. So let's just wait for that to happen, and then we'll get underway. Thank you very much. If the slide's not ready, I can start uh, speaking. Yeah, all right. Let's, John, let's do that. Um, yeah. And we'll let you know if and when the slide comes up in front of us. But yeah, if, if you'd like to start, that would be good. So if we can start the clock now, that would be great. Thank you. Great. Um, yes, I want to speak mainly on the implications of the organic organics processing plant closure and I will make a small comment about the South Library at the end um, time permitting and hopefully there'll be a bit of time for questions um, the the key points um, that I want to make um, are that while I greatly sympathize with the residents of Bromley and the affected suburbs in dealing with the odor issues um, and I support moving the organic processing plant uh, in the future. Um, I strongly believe that the immediate or imminent closure would have some disastrous effects. Um, the closure of the compost plant would to be totally inconsistent with the uh, Christchurch City Council's strategic priority of meeting the climate change challenge through every means available and the council's own policies on waste minimization and climate resilience. Now, while there are several compelling reasons for keeping the plant open until the new facility is ready, the high cost to the ratepayer of the immediate closure and contractual ob obligations with partnering companies, the key reason I want to highlight in this deputation are the climate change implications. Now, in the details in the agenda on this item, um, it is pointed out that just transporting 55,000 tonnes of green waste every year would generate about 274 tonnes of CO2 annually. Um, but the main um, source of greenhouse gas emissions would come from the methane that would be generated, especially when the green waste is mixed with regular waste and landfilled. Um, and I've done um, a little bit of research on this item, um, and I understand that we would be looking at um, the equivalent of about three tons of CO2 per ton of organic matter. Um, that would be because gre uh, uh, methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. Now, I do, I am aware that Cape Valley has a methane capture system and that's used for energy generation. But I, I also understand from reading the papers um, on this item that it may be near capacity already um, and that um, excess methane would be flared off so it would be producing um, CO2, another greenhouse gas, um, in any event. Um, and the problem with all methane capture systems is that they are significant to considerable leakage 
of methane to the atmosphere. So if this option uh, were pursued, um, there would be serious climate um, change or, or greenhouse gas emission implications. Now, I'd like to sort of just uh, explore uh, the possibility of some ways forward. Um, and um, clearly, um, a new composting facility needs to be established as soon as possible. And in the interim, all steps um, possible taken to mitigate and reduce current odour issues associated with the existing plant. But I do make this plea to council uh, and urge councillors to consider the wider and longer term implications of a decision to close the current composting uh, plant um, in, in, uh, before the new facility is ready. Now, finally, I'd, I'd like to make a few constructive um, suggestions um, to try to perhaps look at this issue um, not uh, just as a problem, but also as an opportunity. Um, and of course, the most sustainable and economic um, and climate friendly way to deal with organic waste is to compact is to compost it in your in your own backyard. So I really would appeal to councillors when you're looking at uh, arranging funding for the new composting plant um, that you consider including in the budget funds for vigorously promoting home composting, providing information, community workshops, etc., cetera, um, to households, and even providing composting bins um, to some households if required. Um, the second thing I, I, I would ask is to be considered is um, to support a citywide campaign to reduce food waste as this will both um, you know, reduce the issue of dealing with organic waste, um, but also help uh, households to save money um, in these um, increasingly difficult times, as well as the environment. Um, so that's all I wanted to say on the organics processing plant. Um, I've just got one comment to make on the South Library, but I don't know if it's better to deal with any questions on the um, composting plant if there's time. I think and probably then I'll just make possibly mm. best that we complete the whole um, deputation, the whole okay. presentation, and then come to any questions on both matters after yes. that if there's time. Are you able to see the slides? Or yes, not? we've been able to see your, your slides since very shortly after you started speaking. Well, you will see that I've just got a very brief comment on the South Library earthquake repair options. To me, $25 million seems a huge amount to be spending on a library that has been functioning for the last uh, ten, most of the last 10 years or so um, with the temporary um, steel support members and so forth um, that are in place. I'm a regular user of that library, and I would just really appeal to the council to s explore to see if there aren't some cheaper alternatives than spending $25 million, which I feel is are funds that at this time of a climate emergency uh, and an ecological emergency, and with people sleeping on the pavements of Christchurch, could be utilized um, more effectively elsewhere. If the library has to be rebuilt because you're locked into uh, that by the bureaucratic processes, insurance payouts, etc., then I would really appeal that it is built as a model of sustainability using locally sourced timber with passive solar design, rainwater harvesting, etc. I just want to make one final comment that isn't on a slide, but that is that we are facing an issue that is bigger than COVID, that it will be more disruptive than the earthquakes and more deadly than all the wars that we've ever faced. And that is climate disruption. And the time to act on this issue is now. 
that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that gives us two minutes to move to any questions. Um, I'll take a question from Tim Scander at first. Thank you. Thank you. And just two quick ones on the South Library. Are you aware that in that price is about three and a half million to cover um, any possible um, cost escalation? And the second question, with regards to the building being at 34% NBS, if it fell below that, we would have to close that. And what would your <coughs> thoughts be if we, we suddenly had to close it and its importance with the community and what would, what would be the alternatives unplanned? I, I have to admit that this issue with the library has only recently come to my attention um, and I have not uh, had time to look myself into a lot of different options. Obviously, with the rebuild and so forth, if the facility is closed for 18 months, um, the community could potentially be deprived from that. So I hope there will be some temporary solution. Um, I do appreciate it's not an, an, an easy problem, but I just wonder if it needs a little bit uh, more work and, and research to consider um, possible alternative solutions. Thank you. And that's, we've just started the conversation, so thank you. All right. Look, thank you very much indeed for um, joining us this morning. Um, thanks for the presentation, and we'll obviously move to those items later this morning as we move through the meeting. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. So now I would call our um, second deputation this morning, um, Alexandra Davids, um, who would like to address us on item seven, the wastewater treatment plant matter. Alexandra, if you'd like to come to the table, please. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, you definitely know the drill, 10 minutes. And if you wanted to allow time for questions within that, um, please do. Thank you so much. Um, kia ora, everybody. Thank you for having me this morning. Um, I'm here to speak to you all as the chair of the Waikoura Linwood Central Heathcote Community Board. But um, today I am here in a personal capacity and not on behalf of the board. I say this because our board unfortunately has not been briefed as of yet by staff and we have not had discussions leading into today's meeting. It's important for elected members to be advocating on behalf of their communities and while all communities across the city are affected by the wastewater plant, the community I represent is definitely the most effective. I would like to start by thanking the Mayor and Councillors from Hallswell, Harewood, Waimari, Burwood, Coastal, Innes and of course our local Councillor Yani for attending at least one of the community meetings that have been held in recent weeks. I start by mentioning the different areas of the city that have attended the meetings as this community has felt neglected in recent months and prior years by council as a whole and I hope the interest and concern shown by elected members from right across the city can help to start rebuild a feeling of trust in being part of Otutahi as a whole again. I've attended both meetings held in Bromley and have been following social media pages associated with the Christchurch wastewater treatment plant. And through these channels, many themes, concerns and issues have arisen. I would like to outline some of these today as I believe the support package for effective residents needs to be something well thought through and have both tangible and useful outcomes. The community's health obviously came out as a top concern. The community have discussed having a health register set up for those that are suffering health issues associated with the plant. These mainly being respiratory issues. People have made comments like, if you're feeling unwell, just go see the doctor, get it logged in the system. For a lot of people in our communities, popping down to the doctor is unfortunately something that unless they were really ill is not viable. $50 for a checkup, then the cost of follow-ups is unobtainable and I have concerns that we will be making people leave their ailments till they are in a far worse state. We all know this ends up costing a lot more and can lead to an overwhelmed healthcare system and worse long-term health outcomes. We need to make visiting a medical, medical practitioner more available to the community and having one located in the community of interest 
would lead to having a more collated and informed idea of how the community is coping and what the main issues are that we are seeing coming out of this event. To give you an idea of some of the issues the community are reporting, we have terrible headaches, breathing difficulties. In our schools, they are reporting the same issues. Children are not attending school due to parents having to keep them at home because they are so sick. Most shockingly, it has come to light that some children have been having seizures that until recently have not been a health issue. Schools are told they must keep their classrooms ventilated for our tamariki, and at the same time, they're told to keep their windows closed due to their ongoing issues with the plant. If we do not have a system in place that can adequately collect data and assist aiding these issues being experienced and witnessed, we cannot rule out that these issues are a direct symptom of the demise of our city's wastewater treatment plant. A suggestion has been made as our children are our most vulnerable. We could have hubs set up at schools for a register of health concerns. I would like to pose the question, what will the long-term health effects be for this community and what will the implications be for ongoing health care costs and well-being if we do not address them now? This is not just an issue for humans. This, as we all know, is a massive environmental issue and I appreciate the Council have made note of assisting vet pills for our furry friends. I would like to add a few extra points that have come from this discussion. Um, Pets are now having to be kept inside more often. While their health is the number one priority, there were also issues of wear and tear on residents' home and extra cleaning costs associated with pets being kept inside constantly. <coughs> Continuing with the costs associated with residents' homes, obviously, is the issue of damage that is being done to the outside of the properties. Residents are reporting rusting at rates that they have never seen before, and a film has settled on the property. There needs to be a plan set out on how this is addressed, including support with insurance and remediation and repairs. The issue of air filters and purifiers has arisen and has been noted that they are expensive. There are some that work, and unfortunately, members of the community that have purchased them have found out there are some that don't. Questions have been raised. Can there be funding for ones that do actually work? And can council look at potentially purchasing bulk purifiers to keep prices down? It has also been noted that HIV air socks do not work. Um, I want to thank the members of the community that have made themselves available to run social media pages and hold community meetings. They have, they have been really valuable and to the community. And we are thankful for the time and energy that has been put into keeping everyone informed as much as possible. A great suggestion has been put forward though, that the council should be resourcing a community governance group who are there to meet with staff on a regular basis to find out progress and relevant information, as well as have the opportunity to share any new issues the community may be dealing with at any one time. The group would then report back to the community and be there to field any questions they may have with direct links to appropriate staff that can help. This is what the community need to help make sure council are held to account and are transparent. We must remember every move council makes with this issue in particular, our communities are watching. An example of an issue that has arisen recently is the timing of workers arriving and leaving the plant. A 12 hour workday has been promised and it appears that's not been happening, but perhaps there is work happening off site for preparation for the day. This, however, is not communicated back and thus creates a lack of trust again with the community wanting to trust their council, but are really struggling to do so when they are told one thing and then they witness another. The community governance group would be able to help the communication progress with the relevant questions being asked in a more timely way. Having a detailed timeline and a plan that is visible would also be a huge help keeping our community involved and informed. And if there are changes to the timeline and the plan, those are made apparent as soon as possible to avoid confusion and more mistrust. An initial thought is that the group should be made up of both community members, elected members, and staff that are regular liaisons. I would like to give a big shout out to the Student Volunteer Army for stepping up and helping with our community with their uh, laundry service. 
This is one on a list of many practical solutions that will be fantastic for so many in the community. As I said earlier, I'm here in a personal capacity. The Linwood Central Heathcote Board do have a joint briefing, briefing with Coastal Burwood locked in for the 30th, so thank you for that. While I understand staff time is being used to work on the issue and communicate with the community, this has not been useful for elected members that are being fielded many questions by the community regularly. Apart from the information we read online, the media and social media, we have had no official face-to-face -face contact from Council. We are part of the Christchurch City Council and have a responsibility to be informed and give correct information to our communities. Elected members need to have all information that is being shared with the community shared with them and better contact and information sharing with staff so we can all help each other. This is a Christchurch problem that is affecting our whole city, but hitting our closest residents the hardest. We can't fix this on our own, but if we work together, we can get through the situation faster and in a way that helps the well-being of those most affected. Thank you. And you've left a, a minute for questions, if indeed there are any questions. Jake. Thanks for that, Alex. On the uh, closely related subject of, of the OPP in, in your ward, um, yep. obviously you're aware we've got a paper before us today about, about closure or in the effects of, of, of a closure. Do you have a view on that one? Personally, um, I... Obviously, this has been something that's affected this community for a very, very long time. Um, I know this community want the plant moved. Um, it's been affecting their health for a lot longer um, prior to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so I know this community want to see that plant moved. Um, I think the closure of it is another conversation that you will obviously will need to have today. Um, I do worry about the environmental aspects of closing the plant, um, but I think we need to be looking at it in a really holistic way um, for the community affected, but also the effects that we will be having on um, our environment. All right, look, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to join us this morning with the deputation and the answer to the question. We appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. Now we move to our third deputation of the morning, um, and we've got Bailey Perryman um, on Zoom. Have we got Bailey there? Kia ora. Kia ora. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Now um, you've got um, ten minutes, Bailey, to um, speak to the um, committee, um, and again on item nineteen, the organics processing plant. So thank you for joining us, and your ten minutes starts now. Uh, my name is Bailey Perryman, B-A-I-L-E-Y. Um, last year, I presented to you the localised organics processing trials I have been leading. We had to move quickly to get on the agenda today, so I speak here today in a personal capacity. I want to up date you on our progress given this opportune moment to revisit the original message to you last year and that is there are alternatives to centralized industrial scale organics facilities and these can be scaled across a network of sites to achieve a significant portion of the annual tonnage required of the current organics processing system these localized systems support a host of additional benefits that are also public goods and services, aligning with the existing iwi council and central government strategies, policies and plans. The staff have identified these for you in their supplementary report. In the meeting last year, you resolved to recommend the 2020 composting initiative to the sustainability fund, to liaise with staff and to update you all in six months time. Thank you for this. Our intention was to test the system as if it were operating on an ongoing basis. We've done that. We're making lots of compost, and I have some high-level data to share with you quickly today. With the land we have access to currently, a full-time equivalent of our system would meet 5 to 6 percent or 3,000 tonnes of the current annual tonnage expected of the OPP. The end product is contributing to broader eco-cultural system restoration, and this is the outcome of piloting one methodology. There are other methodologies we have lined up to trial as well. 
Crucially, we aren't annoying neighbours or losing the community-based feeling despite receiving commercial volumes of food and garden organics with over 400 unique site visits from local residents to commercial trucks, we found the plant equipment and personnel we need to manage these materials appropriately according to the natural and built environments we're operating in. Eat, can, consent staff were approached at the beginning of the trials through the pre-application process they have visited along with council solid waste staff they support what we're doing, didn't have a box to put us in, but determined that our operating system is otherwise consistent with a permitted activity and that it could achieve a global resource consent to operate anywhere in the region. Remembering our trials are all within the permitted limits of planning rules for organic composting. It's close to 50 meters to residences on one site within a school at another and the public open space with our third series of trials in the Opakaro Avon River Corridor. Our scale means we are considered as a commercial composter, despite not having commercial intentions for the compost output. This stays on the Whenua. Or for the operation to be, it's not solely focused on profitability. That's not to say the economics don't stack up, however. And receiving commercial scale volumes from commercial operators, we have a clear understanding now of the revenue the system attracts and the additional support we require to scale rapidly. Where you can continue to help is by matching the basic co-investments being made by Fano and the community. It certainly won't cost in the realm of 28 plus million. That brings me to the other half of the resolution, resolution revelation maybe made by council last year which was to consider a partnership with us to continue developing localized organic systems organics processing is a matter you're clearly considering acting on with extraordinary urgent urgency you have the ability here today to back your staff to develop our partnership and to report back to you in a couple of months with a detailed program to scale localized organics processing this would allow the OPP to remain open at a reduced capacity, would diversify your options in the interim while the future of organics is still being decided. The methodologies we can develop and implement relatively quickly are systems that are proven in their own right, and I can evidence this, but they have yet to be pulled together as a comprehensive solution for organics processing at the scale of a city region. In real organic systems, there's no such thing as waste. A tragic state of where we are today, the tragic state of where we're at today is the direct result of the separation we've created between people and the environment. Again, this is an impossibility and we must transform the way we govern ourselves in relation to natural cycles. My deeper concern today is whether you recognize that there, there's a hundred plus year legacy of irreparable damage to the Ihutai created by waste infrastructure choices of this city, including the wastewater treatment plant and the OPP and the land that was confiscated from Iwi in the 1950s. To send all organics to landfill not only fails to recognize the value of this material, it is a continuation of this extremely poor legacy. In the context of the ongoing damage being done to this culturally significant landscape, sending organics to landfill today would look like a knee-jerk response to a relatively short-term problem. I do not support closing the OPP immediately. I do believe there are ways you can move quicker to empower alternatives that are already operating and possess transformative potential. I believe we have a game-changing system for the city and for the whenua. I support your staff on this one. I want to acknowledge the good people you have working on this and we can help because the reality is we're dealing with generations of bad decisions and systemic problems beyond simply the odors of the OPP. And all residents are complicit today, just looking at the plastic contamination in your compost alone coming from the curbside collections. We don't have time to cover this today. Because 
localized alternatives are emerging innovations. They don't fit in the usual boxes where you look to for solutions. The future, or, uh, the future of organics report does not cover localized alternatives, all but presuming that one large industrial processing facility is the only option. We can join in the procurement process forthcoming and wait for that to roll out over the next three to five years, but we'll probably will probably be missed or fall through the gaps. You can use the powers you have today to authorize continuing support for our operating systems and provide immediate relief for local communities. In choosing to develop partnership-based localized solutions, you would be choosing to transform organics processing for our region as a whole, to take a leadership role nationally, potentially even globally. You'd be acting on your responsibilities as treaty partners to support the participation of iwi Māori communities in waste management decisions. And you start on the long road towards addressing the legacy problems of the city's waste infrastructure impacting on te hutai, as well as the issues before you today. I look forward to hearing what you come up with, but rest assured there are passionate people out there today working tomorrow on their weekends and for the foreseeable future to provide solutions that restore a correct balance to our relationship with organics in the whenua and with communities. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Now you've you've left time for um, certainly one question. So Aaron, I'll come to you first. Yeah, thank you for that, Bailey. Um, that was uh, fantastic, and you actually spelt out some of the issues, long term and short term, really, really clearly. Um, if the city was to flip its entire operation on its head and move to what you're suggesting and doing a lot more localized, what's the fastest you could see us as a city moving to a system like that? Oh, that's a that's a big question. We need to do like a detailed design um, and, and programming on that. However, we've achieved this um, latest series of trials and hit that sort of five to six percent capacity in the last six months. So, uh, I would hazard a guess if we could do it a lot faster than three to five years, for sure. Okay, that's very helpful. All right. Thank you very much indeed. That's um, all that we've got time for, unfortunately, in terms of questions. But thank you very much indeed for for joining us, Bye -bye. for um, making the presentation. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. So now we move to our fourth deputation of the morning, and I would invite Bruce King to the table um, to speak to item 19, the organics processing plant. Bruce, thank you for joining us, um, and you have um, 10 minutes, and that would include any time that you might leave, not like to leave for questions. Good morning, and thank you. This morning, I would like to take a few minutes to comment on the latest report to the Council about the OPP. The CCC can break its contract with Waste Management New Zealand at any time for breaking conditions of consent. ECAND have issued numerous abatement notices. A question. What has happened to the 22 million budgeted to upgrade the plant on its present site? The health hazard that this plant produces have been the health hazards that this plant produces have been totally ignored, especially the mental health effects on residents living in the vile localized stink, being un unable to enjoy the outdoor areas of their property, entertain friends and family around the Christmas summer holiday time in particular, when the stink is usually at its highest. The excuse there is no suitable site or operating partners in place is a weak one. Three Waters and Waste have had at least a year to sort out a site and approach suitable businesses to build and operate a new plant. Does the Council want to go down the history as one of the worst in New Zealand because of its inability to protect its citizens from known health hazards? Three Waters and Waste were denying in 2020 that the plant was not compliant, even though Arlene Edwards, the previous CEO, commissioned an investigation by the Becker Group, whose report is titled Christchurch City Council Organics Processing Plant Odour Reduction, Odour Reduction Options Assessment, dated the 9th of July 2015. If you need a copy, I'll lend you one of mine, so you can, you can read through that report. 
the, the CCC, Three Waters and Waste, Division has done all it can to all it can to stop the relocation of the OPP for at least 12 years. What is, is a concern is that the councillors are having to make a decision based on financial advice prepared by the same staff who got the figures wrong back in November 2020 when they advised that the OPP could, should be upgraded on its present site for around 20 million. Well, we all know what tenders came back in at double that. So can you believe any figures they've put in that report today? I don't think so. That's my opinion. This report states that it'll cost eight million a year over a five year period to transport green waste to Cape Valley. But that does not mention the fact that the council is already paying waste management seven million a year to process the waste in its the waste at its present site. This would reduce the cost to taxpayers of only one million a year. Again, figures. I ask you, please. Close this plant now and stop delaying the inevitable. This will give residents some relief from the toxic atmosphere we are currently living in. Um, I have no time for the new designs as the previous speaker talked about to come through. We have had enough of it. 12 years of continuous stink is 12 years too much and totally inappropriate of a council that's meant to help its people and has not provided anything in the way of relief for what we've been going through. Yeah, yeah. And John Gold, his presentation, he doesn't want it close. Obviously, he doesn't live in the stink odour that we live in, even though the wastewater treatment plant stinks. But we know that that's going to be fixed. It's had an insurance policy. But the OPP can be fixed by relocating and not putting anything back on that site. It is 12 years is far too much, and I'm sick of the place and sick of what's been going on. I think we're going to have to take proactive action if that plant is not closed, at least before the next um, green waste collection season, which starts in spring. Thank you for the opportunity. And by the way, this is the fifth presentation I've done to Council on this plant over the years, and that's five too many. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you've left plenty of time for questions. Um, are, there, um, are there questions? Celeste. Um, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying and um, thank you for coming to speak today. I think it might be the first time I've heard you because I'm relatively new. But um, in terms of uh, what kind of relief, because you talked about the relief outside of the technical issue of moving the plant, what things would actually help day to day, you know, in terms of supporting the community? What is the other things that you need to happen to feel like you're being listened to by council? Well, at present, they're dumping the... Uh, waste the compost. Sorry, the compost around the um, sewage farm ponds, and that dust is actually phenomenal. It comes around the place. Even though Ecan did a report of dust collected from my site, which was after a major rainfall, and the footpath and the gutters were running black from the dust that's been coming from that composting plant with the relocating of the dust. Last week, I took my dog for a walk down in Ruru uh, Lawn Cemetery, which I do quite often, and he came back black from the dust, from the, uh, just the dumping of the compost, which is at present is being dumped by the South Brighton Bridge roundabout. And, the, and on um, social media during the weekend, there was reports of the vile stench that the South Brighton School was um, experiencing during the cross country and that was coming from the compost that had been dumped right beside the roundabout because I was down there on Thursday in the South Brighton domain and the stink from the compost was absolutely vile and when compost stinks it is actually creating a health hazard because the bacteria is escaping that is harmful to both animals and humans and the environment and I'd like it gone tomorrow even though I know it can't be done because there's still stacks of windrows there on what they call tailings, which are the two coarse, stuff, two coarse particles from the composting plant to be moved. It actually covers about a quarter of the ground area that was covered previously. I'd like it gone now. And at present, they're operating at night time, doing all their turning and stuff and sorting the compost to try and cover up the smell. But we can smell it. It seeps into our house. It's bloody vile. It's yeah. got to go. Absolutely thank you, Aaron. Yep, thank you for your deputation again, Bruce. Um, the uh, and I'll ask the same question of staff when the time comes. How many households are do you believe are affected by this? Well, it depends on the way the wind's blowing. 
the majority of the wind blows, or it's about 70 to 75 percent of the time it blows easterly. So it's all those in the wind shadow to the east, which includes Linwood, um, some of Aranui, some of Wainoni, some of Avonside, when it's at its at its peak. But then again, it can blow northwest, which it does normally in November. It affects people up on the Mount Pleasant, which they do smell it. People in Ferrymead smell it. People in Brighton and South Brighton smell it. They will be smelling the wastewater treatment plant today, seeing it's blowing southwest. So it depends on the wind. But 75% of the time, we live approximately 750 metres from the composting plant. So 75% of the time, we're in the prevailing wind. And so would you say it's mainly your block, that Mesa's Road, St John Street, Limud Ave, Dyer's Road block would be the worst affected? Well, it would get the most intense smell, but um, the people you can smell it down at Eastgate frequently. Okay. And I asked for a smoke test to be done just to show how, how effective the blowing through the uh, biofilter was, and everyone's refused to do it for me because... The, it blows the air straight up. It blows the air that goes through the filter straight up in the air. But when it hits the nor'east and it, and it loses its force, it comes down in a like a um, wave formation and spreads for miles. We don't know. A few years ago, there was a fire in South Brighton Beach, and the smoke from that spread from South Brighton Beach to Hallsville. So there, are, there's the site where how how far people can smell it if they know what they're smelling. A lot of people don't realise it is the OPP that's stinking because they don't know what it smells like. Drive down Dyer's Road just about any day of the week, you'll smell the OPP. Thank you. Further questions? Yanni. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for the deputation. Um, I just wanted to check with you, since the 1st of February, when the abatement notice period um, ended, how, how many times would you say that you've had to complain about the odour and what sort of impact has it had? Um, I would say I needed to have complained at least once every second day, if not more. But I've given up complaining because I find that the smelter doesn't always work. And I've also found that ringing up, well, you know, another complaint. They don't seem to have any, any great um, enthusiasm for us anymore. And, yeah, I am... I would say basically every second day it would be vile at some time of the day, whether it's during the night, and I know they're working because they're the only ones who work at midnight, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. You can hear the emotion sensors on the loaders and stuff going around. The sound travels that easily at uh, that time of the morning. Unless there's other questions, just a quick follow-up. Yeah, um, one further question. Go on. Yeah, uh, you, you've lived in the area for a number of years. Um, and so you, you would be able to distinguish between what was coming from the wastewater um, treatment plant fire versus what was coming from the organics. Like, it's really clear in your mind that it's the organics plant that's causing the odours that you're talking about to us today. It is. That's my, my main concern. I've got a wind vane and everything on top of my garage, and when it's blowing nor'east, we are right in the wind shadow of that plant. And I know what the wastewater treatment plant smells like, especially the burnt one, because you still smell a burnt smell when it comes across. And northerly wind, we've had too many northerlies this summer summer and autumn, and we've had too much of that stink. Normally, in the previous 20 years that we lived in that place, we would not have had sewer smell on more than two occasions. But northerlies blows it straight into us. All right, understood. Look, thanks very much indeed for once again taking the time to come along and, and talk to us this morning. Um, and obviously we'll get to that paper on the agenda. Um, once we've got through the um, deputations, we'll do the wastewater paper first and then we'll come to the organics processing plant paper. So it'll all be dealt with this morning. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Please so, may I have a point of order, sir? Um, I can't take comments from the public gallery, I'm sorry. Question about I the number of I can't take comments from the public gallery, I'm sorry. Could be heard. Be Can I please January call our next deputation? I recorded 190. I'm going to bring this to a close. Complaints in 365. To invite the next deputation who has booked a deputation to speak to this meeting, to join us at the table. Um, and once again, it will be um, Don Gould. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. So um, I notice you've got a presentation here. You've got 10 minutes 
And as with everybody else, if you wanted to um, leave time for questions, that would be within that 10 minute period. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I send you back again on this issue. Certainly a lively sort of meeting this morning, isn't it? Again. Um, social media update again. I'm not going to dwell on this. There's a bunch of graphs. There's a bunch of pictures. There's more people getting in, uh, showing more public interest online about this issue. Uh, public meeting update. I think Alexander Davis really did cover out uh, the key issues um, from the public meeting. So again, I won't dwell on that. Um, environmental impacts and concerns about the ponds. I am going to dwell a little bit on this one this morning. Um, some of the feedback from the public meeting is that the smell isn't coming from the trickling filters anymore. It's coming from the ponds because they're dead. They're supposed to be an alive, living organism processing our sewerage. Um, when they don't do that, they're just a massive, great big bath of raw sewerage that then emanates um, its odours and its content out into the atmosphere. It is a massive environmental disaster, um, as far as I'm concerned. That's an opinion. I'm not an expert in the field. We simply don't have enough technical information um, on the table from the City Council or from ECAN at this stage in the public domain for me to hold any different opinion, and that is concerning. It concerns me that we have... Um, oh, I'll go back a slide, because... I thought I had something else there. No, it's actually on this slide, I think, somewhere. Sorry, guys. Don't remember what I wrote myself. Um, we've got some pumps coming from Sweden. We need to find out where those pumps are and get them on a plane. Um, and the response I'm getting back is, ah, they're sort of booked for tomorrow. They were booked for yesterday. They're sort of going to be in transit. Uh, don't quite know when. We need an invoice and a master airway bill and a pre-clearance from customs to know where these things are. We need to know the flight numbers that these things are booked on. We need to get them in the network. And we need to know if the pipe work is in place ready to receive them. That's what we need to know. I will move on. The organics processing plant report. What a grenade that was to, sh to throw into this. But that needs to go. John Gould, if you're still listening, um, what a fantastic presentation this morning. The environmental issues are definitely a concern. They've been discussed around my breakfast table as well as lots of other people's. I don't agree with John's um, with John's presentation, a lot of the facts and figures, um, uh, say, for example, composting at home versus taking the compost and sticking it in, meth in Cape Valley, the methane comes off those organics wherever they're located. The difference is with Cape Valley, we can capture it. I do agree that taking it 140 kilometres out of town is a concern, um, but we do have to get it out of this community because the other concern I have is that all of this organic material, coupled with the soda, uh, hydrogen sulfide from the wastewater treatment plant issues, is going to break down the heavy metals in the paint that is protecting the homes of thousands and thousands of people across the city. And from an environmental disaster point of view, that's a bigger disaster when we have to get out the diesel van that I have parked outside my house, drive the petrol water blaster across the town, wash those buildings down, get out my electric sander and sand off the existing paint, repaint them with new paint, probably something that's got a bit more in it than the normal acrylic paint to withstand the, the organics and the loading that we're throwing at them, and then rinse and repeat that every three years instead of every seven to ten years. There is more to the calculations on the table, folks, and we need to get you guys looking at those things. Talking of calculations... Andrew, thank you for an invitation to talk at finance and performance. Let's have a look at something else on the agenda today. Um, I read through the reports. I don't normally read through these reports, but now I'm diving into them. There is a massive underspend on the budget in the IT department. One of the biggest criticisms that this community has made about the organic stuff and with the wastewater treatment plan stuff is that... The communications is poor. Well, communications comes from technology, folks. These things and computers and that sort of stuff. Um, if we're underspending in the IT department then um, and not getting those jobs done, 
the Waikato DHB went offline because they didn't have their servers updated with the latest software. I've just highlighted one example of things that are on your agenda that says that they need to be upgraded by March. We are in May. These reports are not up to date, and that's been another criticism that we have of the reports coming back to the community. The Council's been issuing apologies this week for information that was in today's report that should have been redacted before it got there because the situation has changed. Yes, I'm criticising it, and I'm sorry I have to come here to criticise it, but as a community, it was made quite clear at the second public meeting earlier this week that the community is still particularly unhappy about comms. Techno jargon. What is GEMS? What does an update text actually mean in that? So there's a bit of a summary. You can read it. I'll take questions if we've still got time. Yep, um, and we've got around about four minutes left for questions, um, if indeed there are questions. Sam. Yeah, thank you, Don, for coming in and for um, your, your deputation. Look, one of the things I'm, I'm going to tease out with the staff later on today is around, I guess, there's obviously the, the delivery and actually fixing the problems, um, but also there's a lot of time being spent uh, interacting with individual members of the community, which is which is fine and fair enough. I'm just wondering if you had any ideas on how we streamline that process so we can get the staff actually focusing more on fixing the smell and the problem and in terms of that communication. So, I mean, I watched back your public meeting last night, actually, uh, that you had earlier this week. Can you just maybe talk through some of the key deliverables that the communications need to change on or what we could be doing better? So what, what are some tangible things? Absolutely, Sam. Um, actually, the system that we've got in place works. We just have to use it. Um, uh, if you actually consult with your own information team, Sean Rennie, um, if you're watching Sean, good morning. Um, I'm not sure he's actually a real person and not Sorry, a bot. Sorry, so what I'm, I'm, um, I'm but not the point, What the, I'm meaning is that is, is there easier ways for us to communicate on a more regular basis to stop people having to make individual queries to the council so that we can actually have the staff fixing the problem as opposed to dealing with one-on-one -on -one queries? So do you have a view on that? Yes, of course. Um, provide the updates um, back to a mailing list, which you've got a mailing list yep. already in place. As I said, use the systems that you've got in place already. Um, we shoot in, sh uh, in inquiries to Sean, um, which uh, he triages and then sends that information back through comms um, and back out to the media um, and through your own newsline team, through your own newsletters that are already on online and people need to subscribe to the um, platforms that the council provides. We obviously provide a Facebook platform where we publish everything we get back, um, but the council does actually have official channels for this stuff. They just have to use them and more proactively. We should be getting email updates daily, if not twice, twice a day, as things uh, unfold in the fast-paced moving environment. Right, so the takeaway is you want more regular updates. Absolutely. We don't want a two-weekly meeting. We want a one-weekly meeting, I think. Is, well, that's, uh, I don't know if we've got time, but I'm, yeah, just so I'm really, really clear, I'm talking about the proactive communications from the organisation so that we don't have to have individual residents coming through the team when they could be fixing the problem. So uh, I'm just so you're talking about public meetings or you're talking about emails from the organisation to you? Because if it's, if it's about doing it weekly, uh, I thought we were, but we, we can tease it out with the staff. Um, but we just, I just want to make it easier in terms of how we communicate with you so that the team can focus on fixing the problem. Uh, well, we have that in place. That's, as I said, that's the platform that you've got in place. Just use it. Send out daily updates. Um, answer the questions that come up online. You've got a comms team that are all over the questions coming out in our Facebook channels. Um, they need to engage and actually answer the questions. All right, Possibly I'll take one further question something. from Anne. Yeah. Don. Good morning, nice Anne. To see you. Um, I'm just thinking um, a lot of what we hear from people is that they don't actually, uh, they can't communicate through virtual uh, means because they not don't have devices and things. Have you got any suggestions about how we can better communicate with those people who don't have access to um, online communication? Yes, I have covered that out actually with a manager at the Bromley um, Community Centre and we've discussed um, also reaching out through uh, the school in the local area to understand how many languages are spoken. We also understand that we have a large number of people who cannot read well or even at all and English is not a first language. We have some deaf people following along um, with this. So posters um, at the community centre, flyers, 
um, in the letterbox that are specifically targeted for multilingual um, communications, um, e explaining to people how they can get access to information in their own language. It's also going to mean a community approach, and that's going to be covered out in today's briefing, I think, when we look at a number of welfare centres across the city. Um, that needs to get established, that lot needs to get done, and then we'll have a second wave of seeing what's left to actually pick up the pieces. All right. Thank you very much indeed, Don. Thanks um, for, for joining us again. Just for the benefit of um, those who are remaining to, to speak to Council through deputations this morning, if we can avoid making comments about individual staff or naming individual staff, just as a matter of respect, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, but Don, thanks for the presentation this morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So moving to our next deputation... Um, Finn Jackson um, to speak to us on item 12, South Library. Finn, thanks for joining us. Pleased we were able to make this work. Um, and we look forward to um, hearing from you on the South Library. Like the others, you've got 10 minutes for your deputation, and that would um, include any time that you might want to leave for questions. Thank you. Cool. <clears throat> uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, can everyone actually hear me? Am I speaking to the microphone? Yep, perfect. Yep, cool. Yep. Um, I know I was just told not to make comments about individual staff, but I do want to thank David Corlett um, for arranging for me to speak on really short notice. <laughs> uh, with how, we met, how many people there are here today, I think it's been probably quite busy for him. So yeah, thanks, David. Thank you. Um, I'm here to speak, like Andrew said, about the um, decision due today on whether to repair or rebuild South Library. Um, there's really two messages I want to get across today. Uh, first, that the library is a core part of the local community and that I support the council spending whatever is necessary to get into top shape. And secondly, that the engagement process with the community about the decision, I think, has been pretty insufficient. Um, so first, on the spending, I've lived nearby the library more than half my life. Um, that's maybe around 13 years. And I went to school in the area for another 10 on top of that. Um, I got my first library card there when I was about eight. That was 16 years ago. So, you know, it's been my library for a long, long time. And I really love it there. Um, earlier this year, I'd regularly visit to study and spend time with my partner. Um, I was living at my home. She was living at her home. So it was the only place we could really meet during the COVID pandemic. Um, every time we went, it would be full of people doing all kinds of different things, different kinds of people. Um, you know, one really good example is I saw a large group of retirees exiting the building one time. Uh, they then hopped on their e-bikes and went off on a little cycle ride around the city, which is, you know, just really nice to see people enjoying their, t their time in their local facilities. Um, yeah, it's a real hub for South Christchurch and it should stay that way. Basically what I'm saying is it's well used, it's well loved and it's well worth the money. Now onto community engagement, which will be a little less warm and fuzzy, sorry. Um, so I've been surprised and pretty annoyed, to be honest, um, that the first I or anyone else I know heard about demolition being an option came less than one week before the final decision was due to be made. Uh, we've all believed that a temporary closure for 18 months was what was on the card, just for repair. Um, I don't know anything about the time frame really, for a rebuild, but, you know... Um, to have this come seemingly out of the blue with no chance to influence the decision feels a little bit insulting and a little bit like an attempt to ram it through before the community has a chance to form and express their views. I disagree with the classification under your significance and engagement policy um, that the decision is of low significance. The library is a strategic asset. The decision affects a lot of people, as laid out in the report, and it's potentially irreversible. It's a highly significant decision to this local community. We should have had the opportunity to express our views in a timely manner. At least there should have been a public notice, a community meeting or regular updates. Instead, what happened, what's happened is the kind of thing that erodes trust and confidence, which according to resident surveys and the vibe of this meeting, isn't something the council has much to play around with anyway. Um, I'm not going to ask for the decision to be deferred while consultation takes place because under the circumstances that seems unlikely. You know, we're living in an environment where there's cost escalations all the time. Delaying it again will probably just push the costs up. But what I am going to ask is that no matter the decision you make today, 
a real effort is made to engage the residents of the area in the new design, um, taking a new, uh, like a co-design process. Um, this is so that local residents can have their visions for the library reflected in the end result. Um, it's our library, we live our lives there, and we should have some say in what happens to it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks for those comments. You've, you've left some time for questions, if there are questions. Tim. Um, the way it's been explained to me, when we talk about repair, the only thing that will be left is the floor and the roof. So when we talk about repair, and that's where the, the discussion with the community will be, is when we're, and I think there's a bit of confusion about repair and rebuild. Technically we are, either way you're looking at it, it's going to be rebuilt. So when that is going to be done, that is when we will liaise or bring in the community because we've had some really good feedback already. So are you aware of that? Um, I wasn't, actually, I was a little bit aware of that. Not, maybe not on all the details. Yep. Um, yeah, like I have said, my main quibble is with the process yep. around engagement. So it's not on which option is taken um, because like you said, it's basically a full rebuild whether there's a repair or not. Um, and just two, if I may, two quick things. Yep, One quickly. is there is, as I mentioned before, three and a half million dollars in that mm -hmm. budget with regards to um, protection against cost escalation. So hopefully that won't be used. And it is currently at thirty-four percent NBS. Mm -hmm. And if it fell below that, and it is, as you well know, it's been as we've talked, it's been kind of um, braced, etc. If it falls below that, we have to close it as an unsafe building, mm -hmm. and that would be an absolute would be horrendous for that local community, our community. Yeah, that would be tragic. So it's yeah. better to try and plan a way forward so we're all prepared for everything. Yeah. Thank you very much, Finn. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you. Aaron. Yeah, thank you for your deputation. Uh, so just a question around, because $25 million is a lot of money, especially mm. when you've got people sitting behind you that want organics plants moved and others that want the sewage treatment uh, job fixed quickly. So. When you go in and out of that building, do you feel that it's at its end of life or do you feel that that community would be happy to keep using it as is for another 10 or however many years, as long as it's safe and minor repairs are done, i.e. air conditioning or chip paint, whatever. Do you think they would accept that or not? Um, I'm not a structural engineer, so I can't really speak to oh, no, we I employ those it's... to do the reports oh, to make sure that if it ever drops to a level that's unsafe, it would be closed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think people really love the library, obviously, like I've said. Um, they like it in its current state. I think as a council, you need to really take a precautionary approach. And if there is a risk of it falling below the building standards, um, you know, you should fund the repairs. Um, I don't think deferring it's a good idea. It's been deferred several times already. Um, yeah. Thank you. And Galloway. Yeah, kia ora and thank you, Finn, for a very considered and respectful um, deputation. Um, um, there's a bit of a common theme coming through here about communication mm. and engagement. You've obviously thought about it. What could council have done better in this situation in, in engaging with the community so that it didn't come out of the blue, I think you said? Yeah, yeah well, um, like I said, it came out of the blue. Um, and like I said in the uh, presentation, what I would have liked to have seen is some public meetings or a notice or something like that. Um, I know you're doing public briefings at the moment in some situations, so a public briefing with the community board could have been good because um, I'm not actually sure if they've even been briefed on this. Um, yeah, I think the communications of council do need to be fixed up a bit. Like you've said, um, people sitting behind me have had real problems with them and it's you know a real disappointment really sad and they deserve better I can't I'm not a comms expert I'm not doing a communications degree or anything so I can't exactly point to solutions at the moment um, but if I have any ideas I'll let you know yeah. all right Yanni thank, uh, thank you um, given that we still have to make a budget decision as part of next year's annual plan or draft annual plan, do you, do you think this is the sort of thing we should have put in this year's draft annual plan so people could make submissions? Because otherwise we're not really able to, to do anything yeah. quickly anyway, so we would have time to consult 
you know, around options now that wouldn't delay it. And I know you said you just want us to get on and not delay it, mm. but I don't quite see how that would prevent us from consulting given we still have to make the budget decision next year. Mm, gotcha. Um, yeah, so on the first part of your question, I probably would have said that's something that should have been involved in the annual plan this year. Um, I'm not sure if that would have been possible, obviously, because, you know, the report, it appears, was completed quite recently and only came for decision now. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. You know, so given so. that we, we're not yeah. making the budget decision until next year anyway, yeah. um, there seems to be plenty of time to consult. Mm. Like we could actually consult or in the options with the community now yeah. ahead of making the decision that we're being asked to make today that wouldn't necessarily delay the project. Okay. Yeah, if that's possible, then absolutely go ahead and do it. Um, the reason I came here and said that I didn't think it should be def um, consulted on was because I spoke to a few people and they said it would result in delays which might impact on the um, project. I can hear some other people saying that there will be delays. So, um, All right. Yeah, I mean, that's a question that can be asked of staff when we get to the item and, and we can get some advice from staff on that. Um, Finn, look, thanks very much indeed for joining us and sharing your views with us this morning. Um, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we move to the last deputation of the morning, um, Michael Williams. Um, I'd invite you to the table, Michael, um, again on item seven, the wastewater treatment plants, and item 19, the organic processing plants. Thank you. And again, if you wanted to leave time for questions within the 10 minutes, that's open for you to, um, to do so. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and thanks very much again for the opportunity to speak on this on this hugely important issue for the community. Now, apologies for being late. Since a multitude of things happened today, but I did get here. So today, I don't have any fancy screens. I prepared a speech that took me several hours, and I sat there and I read it the other night, and I thought, no, I'm not going to bring anything today, because this is an issue for me that's all about from the heart. Now, now I really want everybody in this room to absolutely consider what's going on here today. We're making decisions today about people and communities. We're not making a decision about how many seats should go into a grandstand or what type of roof we should have or should we rip up St Asib Street or, or whatever. This is a decision about a community, the Bromley community, and this decision you make today will have a long-term effect on these residents, potentially for five years. Now, I would describe it today, and I thought about this long and hard, as a watershed moment. It's a watershed moment for you guys because to, to, the, the importance of it cannot be over, overstressed. You've actually got to, to me, reach into your hearts and have a serious think about how do we want these people in this Bromley community to live? Do we want them to go on experiencing what's pretty similar, to be quite honest, to the wastewater work treatments odour? 90,000 people are saying they're up in arms about it. We, we have a huge amount of empathy at the moment going on for our community. I've never seen the likes of it before because they've actually got a bit of a dose of what we've had to live with for years. Yeah. And so reach into your hearts and, and honestly ask yourselves, is money more important than the health and well-being of the community? And what is my primary responsibility as an elected councillor? To me, it's to look after the health and well-being of the community. Certainly you've got to manage the financial restraints, yeah, yeah. But, but it is the health and the well-being. So really, please reach that when you make this decision. Now, I want to talk about it, lighten it up a wee bit. I was listening to John McDonald the other morning. I don't know how many people do here. I imagine you've got quite a few secret John McDonald listeners. And he's talking about um, moving the organics plant. And a guy called Leon came in. Well, I've heard, I recognise his voice and I've heard his name. And then Leon started to make some statements that were absolutely dumbfounding. And one of the things he said was, Everything was going fine until we had some residents over in the Crescents start to create issues. Now, I would just very, very quickly like to ask these guys to stand up. Could you stand up, please? Could you stand up? Vicky, could you stand up? Have a look at these people, guys. Do they look like renegades, re re renegades ratbags, troublemakers to you? Or do they look like concerned citizens with a high degree of intelligence who can actually get out there and get some stuff done and raise some issues? Bruce is a details person with a mind like a steel safe. Vicky is fighting for a husband who's extremely unwell and very concerned about the environment and the atmosphere in which they're living in. Jeffrey, well, he's our rock wheeler. 
he gets in there and he attacks because he has had an absolute guts full of it and he's not the kind of person who's going to sit back lightly and, and just put up with it. So, so these are the people that were mentioned. I just thought I'd like to point that out. But they are some of the best people in the community and they, in my opinion, they deserve medals. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Right. This is a stumble, but on we go. Um, the cost of relocating the plant. Now, when we sat down, we did, we did, the, we did the sums and, and we had the meeting and we come back with $21.5 million, I think it was, to upgrade the plant. When the tenders went out, that didn't even come within 50% of the cost. So for me, personally, when I look at the costings, do I have a lot of faith in those costings? I've absolutely none. Absolutely none. It's going to take a lot of work to convince me that that $41 million or whatever it is, the cost of relocating that rubbish out to Cape Valley, is, is an accurate and true representative of the cost. I'd also like to mention we have other, other assets in the community that could potentially be used. We have a railway line, the main north railway line, runs straight out to Wipra. We could set up a railhead out there and perhaps cart the rubbish by rail. Okay, so, so some rich fat cat who owns a trucking company is losing money. Big bloody deal. This is about reducing emissions, getting traffic off the road and running an efficient system that works for this community. I mean, I don't know if that's been considered, but I think, I think it's certainly well worthwhile considering. And the other thing I'd like to talk about, and I did mention this at the previous meeting, was the, the apparent lack of a health register for the people, in the, in the, particularly at this point in time, in the Bromley community. Um, had, nobody appears to have gone around, and I'm not saying go to your GP. What I'm saying is we need to set up, set up a, some, a, a party through the health board who can actually go out and door knock. These people may be incapacitated. They may not have transport, or just maybe disengage from their community and, and unaware. But I think it is absolutely critical that we do long-term monitoring of the health effects. We're still a little bit unsure about these gases. We're still a little bit unsure about the effects. But we've got to have a register and have a starting point so we can go back and say, right, at this point in time, we had Mr B at address such and such, had, had a little bit of light asthma. Now, two months later, he's having trouble breathing. But we need to have that starting point, we need to have that record. And I think it's absolutely critical. And I'm surprised we haven't done it. Because once again, your responsibility, people, is the health and care and the well being of the residents of the community. Yeah. And and it slipped a wee bit. It slipped. A wee bit. Um just I'd just like to touch again about the importance of, of today. It's a watershed moment. Um, you know, it, it really is not about nuts and bolts. It is about a living community who have struggled for over 10 years, potentially now facing 15 years of the same, the same odours. Um, I had a discussion with them. They talk about the resource consent and they talk about the odour um, is not to exceed the fence in an unreasonable manner. I mean, this is quite a vague sort of statement really to have in a, an operating resource consent. But it always exceeds. It always exceeds the boundary line. Yep. So, I mean, resource consents. What are they? What is a resource consent actually worth? Yeah, but I've been told by my colleagues that when the uh, living earth was constructed, constructed, it didn't meet the resource consent. It's never ever met the resource consent. How can we? How can you guys, as a local body council, elected representatives, allow? A, a, a commercial operation that's making money and sending this money back to the council as well, which is a terribly bad look when people understand the issues. Sort of, you know, you're taking and giving of one hand and you're getting the money back. And, and this fact, this building has never met the resource consents. I mean, what I'd like to see is to go right back to square one with it and actually have a look at it and say, right, what is it? What is, get some of the local experts. Like Bruce and... Uh, um, you know, and, and have a look at it, because if it's made, if it's not meeting its resource consents and its construction, how can we continue to allow it to operate? Now, the other thing I'd like to touch on is Cape Valley itself. There's been a lot of talk about the location shifting to Cape Valley. Um, I've never been to the site, but it does seem to make sense to have everything located in the same area, have your traffic, traffic flows, your logistics, and everything working in together. 
Um, if we were to do that and we start moving the green rubbish out at the same time as we get the construction underway, I don't know, why, why can't we sort of be doing two things at once and, and dealing with the rubbish? Um, at the end of the five years, instead of being left with a stinking problem, we've actually solved the problem, we've got an efficient flow of rubbish and we're actually dealing with it in a way that's fair and reasonable to the community. Honestly, I for one have had a bit of a guts full of the you know, and you talk to people, your neighbours and everything. I've got neighbours that can't walk. You know, they'd love to come to these meetings and have their voice. So it is important that we actually stand up and speak for all the people in the community. But today is your day, guys. This is it. Be on the right course of history. Don't wake up one morning and think, I didn't do the right thing there. Because your journey as a councillor, it's a cycle. Yep, you, you stand, you get voted in, you go through the motions, you make some really big decisions. But at the end of it all, you, come out, you go out the door like everybody else and the cycle starts again with maybe somebody else. And then you might have to wake up and ask yourself, what did I actually achieve? Did I do the right things? What did I achieve for that Bromley community? Did I on the day have the courage to stand up and say, no, we need to move that rubbish, that rubbish facility and we need, to move it to, we need to stop that stuff going through and we need to stop it tomorrow? There are ways of thought about, perhaps we could pull the, red, the green bin out of the system and use the red bin. So we stack everything into the red bin and, and then not collect the green bins, just collect the red bins on a weekly basis. I don't know. Would that potentially work? I don't know what the logistics and flows of that business are, you know, but would that potentially work? All but, right, look, that brings us to the end of the, the 10 minutes for the deputation. Thanks for coming to um, talk to us once again about you know, these matters that clearly are really important to you. The points that you've made are, are well received. So thank you very much indeed for taking the time. Thank you. And thank you to all of those who've taken time out of their day to come and, and make these deputations and presentations to us this morning. Um, we know that a substantial amount of thinking and a substantial amount of work has gone into what you've prepared and what you've told us, and we can see how passionate you are about the, um, the matters that you've presented. So thank you to everybody that's been part of our meeting so far. Now, what I'd propose that we now do, it's um, 10 to 11, is break for 15 minutes for morning tea, come back at 11.05, and um, at that point, we'll deal with the wastewater report first. So the um, item seven, the wastewater treatment plant recovery update, we'll do that immediately after morning tea. And then we'll move to item 19, the implications of organics processing plant closure. So I'll adjourn until five past 11 when we come back for those matters. Thank you.